folder, there is an outline. And uh, I use this quite a bit in, in, uh, on Sundays. And so I invite you to come join me as we look together. And we'll be studying some scripture here this morning, okay? Working together in God's Word. How many of you, I'm going to date some of you this morning, how many remember the, or watched or was raised on the TV program Mission Impossible? Anybody like that would admit to something like that? That TV series started in 1966. And the gist of the, of the, of the series would be that there would a secret service agent. He would walk into a closet or into an obscure place, a phone booth or something, and he would find an old reel-to-reel tape player. He would push the play button, and the button would say something like this. It says, your mission, if you choose to accomplish it, is to find a person or look for a secret document or solve a crime, or do a heroic uh, deed. And, uh, and then after it would describe what was needed to be done, the tape would say something like this. This tape will self-destruct in five seconds. And then the secret agent would go out and he'd be the hero. He would take care of all the issues that are going on. Last Sunday, we celebrated Easter. And as Jesus appeared to his disciples, we'll talk about that here in, in, a, in a moment, he was trying to convince them that he was truly alive. And as he was giving them his message that he was alive and showing himself to them, he gave them a mission to do. He gave them a job to do. And I want you to go back in your memory, if you would, if you were here last Sunday, we talked about it, and I want to use one of those same passages of Scripture uh, this morning. It's found in John chapter 20, and we'll read that short story in just a moment. But this is what's happened. This is on Easter day. Jesus had arose from the dead that morning and several of the ladies had come to be in that uh, time period and come to find Jesus and they and they went back and they told the disciples that Jesus had arose and uh, but they didn't believe him and so the disciples there were 10 of them at this point there were 10 of the disciples in in, in the upper room this is the same place where they had had the last supper on, on Thursday evening. And so they were assembled together, but it was not like a party atmosphere at all that was like on Thursday evening. The scripture says that these, these 10 disciples, they were, they were huddled together in pair. They had watched the Pharisees. They had watched the Romans. They had, they had watched them and, and abuse the body of Jesus. And they knew that their turn was next. And they were in this little upper room. It was a second story room. And the door was locked. And every sound, every step on the stairway was, was a fearful, uh, terrorizing feeling. There was silence in the room. These 10 folks knew that their life was over. And these disciples, were, they were just huddled together. And they were just, it was, it was an it was a eerie feeling, fearful feeling. Have you ever had a panic attack before? Where your heart beats crazy and you can't hardly breathe. And your body does all kinds of strange things. And these guys were experiencing that or very close to that. They were huddled in fear. And suddenly in that dark room, Jesus appears to them. And right in the middle of all of this fear, Jesus says to them, my peace be unto you. Now I want us to take a moment and I want us to read that passage of scripture. If these disciples ever needed peace, this was the point. If they ever needed to see Jesus, this was the time. So let's read together in John chapter 20 and verses 19 and verses 23. It's just a short passage of scripture and it's kind of nice we're able to 
have it on the screen up here, and so you can be a part of that and read with me. So it's John 19, or 20, verse 19. It says, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Now let me stop right there. This is a, a beautiful scene that has taken place. Uh, Jesus is coming into this impossible situation. And the first thing he gives to them is his peace. Peace means, if you were here last Sunday, we talked about this, may all good things happen to you. And so he's saying, I want good things to happen to you. But right when he said, peace unto you, he says he gave them a message. He gave them something that God had given to him. It was almost like mission impossible. Because they thought it was all over. They thought Jesus was dead. They thought their life was over. They thought their faith was dead because they put their faith in Jesus. and He's gone. And they're in fear. And they don't know what to do with themselves. And they're just waiting to be crucified themselves. And Jesus here, I want you to you've got to understand the, the setting of the scripture. Jesus says unto them, he says, I have something for you to do. If you go to verse 21 and notice what he says there to, the, to these disciples. He says, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. Now, this is, think about it. There is fear, and then there's peace, and then there is a commission. There is a job to do. That is, that is the same thing that God does in our life. We come in fear. We come when doubts, we come with all kind of things that we're not quite sure about. And in the midst of that, God brings his peace. And then he says, by the way, there's something that I need you to do. So in your outline here, let's real quick, let's kind of work our way, way through this. First of all, in just uh, the, uh, this commission, this job to do, was upon what God had given him to do. So number one is Jesus is dependent upon you and I to continue God's work on earth. Jesus is dependent on you and I to do God's work. Now, maybe your first reaction is, is I'm not good enough, or I don't know enough, or I'm scared. Think about these disciples for a minute hearing those words. Man, you talk about someone living in doubt, someone living in fear. These guys knew that their life was, open, was over. God knows very much how human we are. He knows our doubts. He knows our, our, our prone to discouragements. He knows our fears. And yet, in, in, sequentially, he just says, guys, I'm here. And by the way, there's something I want you to do. To continue God's work on our earth, if we take the commission, if we take the instructions that's given to us, to continue God's work on earth means that God wants to reconcile all people back to himself. God is a very loving God. He's, he cares. In Luke chapter 6 and, and 19 and verse 10, this is the great commission, or this is, excuse me, the purpose of Jesus. This is the purpose for his life. This is what he said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. So this is a God who is coming into this world and says, I have a better life for you. Satan in the beginning destroyed God's original plan. God brought the Ten Commandments. It was hard for men to follow that, so God brought Jesus into this world. God says, I've got something better than living in the past, living in the old life. Jesus brought God's message to, me, to man. And now Jesus is gone. Jesus can't go to all the places in the world. Jesus can't go to every um, language and every groups of people. And so this is called the commission for the church. This is what you and I do. This is what our responsibility is. 
The second thing is, is we are dependent on Jesus to finish God's work on earth. Jesus needs us, but we need Jesus. A person who is to be sent needs someone to send him. He needs a message to tell. He needs a power and authority to back up the message. He needs someone to whom he may turn to when there's questions and difficulties and hardship. And when without Jesus, we as individuals or even as a church, we have no, no, no message to say. We have no power to say. There is nothing that we can give. There's no hope. Without Jesus, there is no forgiveness of sin. There's no real lasting freedom. Without Jesus, there's no real peace. There's no rest. There is no joy. Jesus, when he came into this world, set these disciples free. And as you notice, they still lived in fear. And we're going to talk more about that in a moment. But he gave them their life back. I, there's a scripture passage that has just been so big in my life and probably in the last, I don't know, six months, I think about it, I, I go back and dwell on it. It's in Matthew chapter 11. Notice the words, if you would, on the screen here this morning. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. And as we read this verse, I want you to look at the personal pronoun. How many times does the word I appear in here? And he said, and and say it with me, and who? I will give you rest. Jesus said, I'll give you rest. What does that mean? You can sleep good at night. There's a calm and a peace in your heart. You can enjoy life. You can enjoy what God's given. So verse 29, take my yoke upon you. And he's talking about take my responsibilities on you, okay? Let me teach you because, say it with me, I am humble at heart. In other words, you don't need to know more. You don't need to know less. You don't need to be more educated. It's not the, where you came from or where you're going. You can, Jesus, you can come to Jesus because he is someone who was born in a barn, born out in a, in a, in a, in a shepherd's uh, pen. Uh, he was crucified, and some say even naked because of, of the, how the Romans were trying to humiliate him. The scripture says he was tempted in every point like you and I, and yet without sin. You and I, wherever we are, we have the privilege to come to him. So he says, I'm gentle and humble at heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. The word yoke means that my relationship to you is, is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Early this morning, I was praying this passage of Scripture, and I come to this part where it says, the burden I give you is light. The question I ask you this morning is the burden you carry in light. And if it's not light, whose burden is that? Perhaps we are carrying burdens and loads and pressures that do not belong to us. And we assume those responsibilities and we take on those tasks and, they, and we make them ours. He says, your burden, he says, my burden is light. Boy, does God have to remind me about that all the time. It's not about me. It's about what he's doing and what he has for me. I think somebody's phone's going off. Hello? It says Russ Turner is buying this lunch today. I like mine medium rare, please. Baked potato, apple pie, ice cream. And I'll leave you a nice big tip because Russ is going to pay for this. I'm going to pay for this, all right. <laughs> Folks, I've had some crazy things happen when I've preached before. That's the first on that one. 
time I was preaching outside and there was a fly that went by and he went by and he went by and he went down. And I thought, what do I do now, you know? You swallow and you go on, you know? That's what you do, you know? Sorry, guys, it was already back there. There's nothing you can do. That was just a warning. Don't come up and kiss on me. You never know what's, what's, what's going on. Where were we? I think we were talking about where it says, my burden is light, and I heard the light sound of a phone, all right? So uh, that, that's where we are. We need Christ. He needs us. Without you and I, God cannot complete his work on earth. I want you to Without you and I, God can't do what he needs to do. And without Jesus, we can't do God's work on earth. Can I say this and say it very gently? And I'm not trying to cause problems, cause issues, and that sort of thing. But there are churches and ministries who take Jesus out of their church and out of their ministry. I don't want to tell you, folks, you take Jesus out of what we're trying to do, and it's just a social club. It's just, just you know, Jesus is the power. He is the source. He is the grace. He is the truth. That's what we build our life. Path. The third thing is, we are dependent on the Holy Spirit as much as we are on Jesus to continue or to complete God's work on earth. Don't you think we Notice what Jesus did next after he gave his commission. Notice in verse 22, I didn't read that with you. So again, the setting, disciples are all freer, on tear, they're just ready, you know, they know the next, next noise is going to be, you know, they're going to be hauled off, crucified. Jesus comes, he says, I'm going to give you peace. And then he says, I have a job for you to do. This is how the job is to be completed. Notice if you would, in verse 22. He says, then he breathed on them and it said, receive the Holy Spirit. Wow. Isn't that, isn't, that, isn't that a neat thing? Do you remember the story of the creation of man? In, in Genesis chapter 2, it says, God breathed into Adam the breath of life. The coming of the Holy Spirit is like God breathing life into our body. But it's not the breath, breath of life into our body. It's the breath of God into our heart that changes us, that motivates us, that comes into our world, and it just, it just changes who we are. Verse 22, when Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit, the word for receive means to take or grab or to receive. Uh, to take into one's possession, to acquire, to take my portion, to take what belongs to me. And so he says, I want you to have my peace, but I want you to have my, my spirit within you. You can have the knowledge, but he says, I want you to have my heart. So the Holy Spirit is stronger than the spirit of fear. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of compassion and mercy that reaches out to those who have need. The Holy Spirit is the needed source of commitment to endure hardships and discouragement and difficult times when you go through ministry, when you have a church, when you live a Christian life, the warfare that comes. You need something stronger than the, than the things that are around you. The Holy Spirit is a source of dreams and vision that God gives for the spirit of ministry. And so this is how Jesus wanted to equip these, these, these young disciples. He says, you need my, my peace, you need my, my commission, but the only way you can do that is by the Holy Spirit coming into your life. Now, isn't this an interesting story, the whole process, how it works? But it doesn't stop there. Jesus says something that is just, when you think about it, it it's just so, the progression of this is so in, in, important for us to understand. Jesus says something about what's going on in us. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to happen in us before it can happen around us. Notice what he says in verse 23. 
He says, if you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Or they will not, uh, they are not forgiven. Yeah. So the Holy Spirit says, again, peace, commission, the Holy Spirit. And then he says, before you guys go out, before you begin ministry, he says, you need to do a heart inspection. You've got to look within you. And the thing that he talks about is, this, is the area of forgiveness. If I was to ask you the question this morning, is there anyone in here that has never been hurt by another person? I doubt if we would have anybody who would raise their hand. If I'd ask the person, ask you a question, have any of you been betrayed by someone you had a lot of confidence in? That, everyone would probably raise their hand. Yes, there's, there's someone who is hurt and someone who, is, who has uh, done things that are very wrong to you. Jesus is saying, guys, I just demonstrated what forgiveness is. He was on the cross. He did not retaliate. He didn't, he didn't speak out against the Romans. He didn't speak out against those who beat him and abused him. And he's saying, guys, I didn't do this. You can't do this on your own. This is the illustration of my power in the Holy Spirit. So forgive me. To forgive is to release your rights to hold on to an offense. It's to let something go. Um, unforgiveness clogs up the work of what God wants to do in our heart, in our life. These are mature believers. These are those who had been around Jesus for a length of time. And he's trying to say, before you go out to do your ministry, let me do my ministry in you. And the spirit of forgiveness is one of the greatest strongholds that Satan uses against you. Fence happens. Hurt takes place. As I mentioned, someone abuses someone else. Uh, takes advantage of us or someone in our family, someone who, who maybe on purpose, maliciously, just trying to destroy you or destroy your name or your family or, or whatever. And, and, and humanly, we can't do that in our own. Jesus is saying, if you allow me to do my work in your heart, allow me to build my kingdom in your heart and Sometimes the first way of forgiveness is saying, oh Lord, this is in your hand. I can't do this. You know, bitterness is a terrible disease. It's a disease of the heart. It's a disease of the mind. Bitterness will just destroy all of the work of God that he's trying to do in our life. Bitterness is something that we just, it, we hold on to, and, and we have resentments that build up. You know at times that uh, my poor wife picked on Kevin here, you know, a minute ago, a little bit ago, but time Pam and I will have differences of opinion. And uh, we don't call it, you know, a fight. We call it a... Uh, crazy. <laughs> intense fellowship is what it's called. I'm sorry. I couldn't think. Thank you. Thank you. It's called intense fellowship. All right. So we Christians, we have special words for our, our fights and different things, you know. So we have that intense fellowship time. And, and whatever she does, you know, she just, just, just bugs me, you know. You ever been there before? You just, and it's just like, you know, and so once I get that spirit of bitterness starting to grow in my heart, whatever she does, she just does stuff to annoy me. She just does, she just does it on purpose. But you know what's happening is that spirit of bitterness has gotten so big and so strong that she didn't do that to annoy me. That's just her life. But I interpret things in out of it. it just washes over my mind that bitterness is just 
kind of, it just there. And everything she does and everything she says, I interpret it through the ears of bitter. And so Jesus is saying to you and to I this morning, he says, let me do my greatest work in you. And that's the, the ability to love. Remember the joy, or excuse me, the rest, Calm, Matthew 11, 28, 29, 30. That's what my God is. That's what we build in through. Again, can I just tell you the progression of this story? Jesus is alive. The disciples don't believe. They're in fear and trembling. They're about to have a panic attack. They're afraid of the Romans. All at once, Jesus appears in the middle of them. How did that happen? I have no idea. How does God do his work? I have no idea. But I know that he's a big God and he can do what he wants. So he appears to them right in the middle. He gives them what they desperately needed. They needed peace. And then he gives them the commission. He says, guys, you are my hands. You are my feet. You are my mouth. You are. You need to take my place on this earth. You need to continue the work that I have started as I go back to the Father. He gave them and then he says, before you go out, I need to give you the power in my source of strength for you to do what I called you to do. And that was the power of the Holy Spirit. But then he says, guys, remember your heart. Remember to keep your spirit open. Remember to make sure that you not hold on to grudge. How do you begin to pray? You always begin with God's heart. You always begin here. You never begin with your head. You hear truth. You understand what's being said. But you always begin a relationship. And you listen to what God is doing in your heart. In your heart, you'll hear your heart beat. You'll hear what's going on. And Jesus will always show us our need. Maybe it's the need to have our sins forgiven. Maybe it's the need to release somebody, to forgive someone, to let something go, an offense go. And in our own strength, we can't do that. And so the way we begin to let go, as we say to Jesus, Jesus, I, all I, when, when, when you talk to me, all I hear and all I feel, all I see is this person who hurt me or this name or this situation. All I know is just, that's in my mind. That's what it is. So Jesus says to you and to I, let me help you take it. Let me, let me be a part of your life. Let, come to me. Acknowledge that big stronghold or that big, big part or block or rock or whatever it is. He says, let me have access to that so that I that's where freedom we were singing the song he's a chain break man he is a powerful god he is and he breaks stuff in our heart is it right perhaps what the person had done to us no it's not right we will probably never change their attitude or their mind they will probably never come back and apologize what happens in us changes us. We can experience the joy of God, the forgiveness of God, the release of God. And it is out of a pure heart. It's out of our heart that we express love and care and kindness and our word of comfort and help, help others to know the price. I know I'm done and quiet here, all right, unless the phone goes off or something like that. I've been reading a book. It's called Untamed Christian and Unleashed Church. It's about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read just a little paragraph. Don't you imagine the picture? This is what God has designed for you and for the church. It says someone should stand up for the service give instructions like those heard every day prior to a plane airplane 
you know. He says, God will be here today, and we may face some turbulence. When he comes, make sure hard hats are secure. Put your seat in the safe and upright position. Fasten your seatbelt. It may be a bumpy ride. If needed, oxygen will be supplied for all who find themselves gasping for breath. The air gets thin. The air gets thin when we're where we are going. And thanks for choosing to worship today with people of the presence. The presence of the Holy Spirit. What God is saying, he says, guys, he says, get ready for a rock. Because I want to work in your life. Power. Can I just say this this morning? The spirit of fear is It is a strong. It was all over the disciples. They had every, in their mind, they had every excuse not to be used. Jesus said, guys, the Holy Spirit is the Some of these guys had stuff in their heart. Perhaps they didn't forgive Peter for Peter's betrayal of what they, he did to Jesus. I don't know. But I know Jesus' his spirit is strong enough to understand what goes into our heart. All of us here this morning, our level, our need, what he wants to do, he wants to work wherever we are. Jesus came into that room and said, Guy, before you go out, he says, we've got to deal with this. You've got to let it go. You've got to let it go. Can I say to you this morning, there are those I this morning who have been laboring, holding on to things for too long. And it's about robbed you of your life and it's robbed you. And it's robbed you. When I was in class, praying for ministry, the psychiatrist, Council come in. He was saying, guys, he said, one of the big things you're going to deal with. He says, when people hold on to things, he says, their body eventually begins to break down and their body begins to express holding on to their heart. So our whole letting God not to let me just hold you. You build yours. Oh, oh, oh. Just letting Jesus be real big. His, his purpose, his desire to build life in this building is just place where God shows up, people of God 